Okay, so this is a recording for the second half of Module 9 in Physics. Um, and um, let me just quickly review the formulas that we went over last week. We said that momentum is equal to, equal to mass times velocity. Mass is in kilograms, velocity is in meters over seconds. So the units for um, momentum are kilogram meters per second. Okay, then we also um, talked about um, impulse and we said that um, in order to get a change in momentum, you provide a force um, in the same direction as the momentum times time. So um, we said how this applies in sports, like hitting a ball with an implement, whether that ball is hit with a tennis racket or a baseball bat or a puck, a hockey puck hit with a hockey stick. You can increase the momentum by increasing the force, swinging faster, harder, um, or, um, but also by increasing the time that the implement is in contact with the bat or the stick or the racket. Um, and we said that we do that by um, follow through. So when a coach has told you to make sure that you follow through, um, it is so that you can increase the amount of time that the ball or whatever is in contact with the implement um, so that you can increase momentum. Okay, so those are two formulas that we did. Um, and if we were to rearrange, rearrange that equation that I just put up there, then we could also say that force is equal to the change in momentum divided by the change in time. So um, if you, and, and we said that the change in momentum is the momentum uh, after minus the momentum before. And we worked some problems last week um, with regard to that, so I'm not going to um, go over those again now. Though I will, we, we will go. We're going to go over the um, in a separate video. Video. I'll do all of the problems that are at the uh, end of module nine. Okay. So then um, uh, we may. I think we talked a little bit about last time about conservation of momentum. So previously, we have talked about the law of conservation of energy, so that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Um, well, um, momentum also must be conserved. And um, if we assume that there are no forces acting on an object, so we said that force is equal to delta P over delta T. Well, if we assume that there are no forces acting on a system, then we get zero is equal to delta P over delta T. If we multiply both sides times delta T, that cancels that out, and this is, is zero. So we get that zero is equal to a change in momentum. So um, basically what we say is that if, if there are no, uh, if the sum of the forces acting on a system is equal to zero, then momentum will not change. The change in momentum will also be equal to zero. And that is what the law of conservation of momentum states, is that if the sum of the forces acting on a system is equal to zero, then the momentum 
will not change. So there'll be no change in the in the momentum of the system. So the first thing when you when you think about this, first of all, you probably immediately think about the fact that um, there's almost always forces acting um, on something. So we know that friction usually is acting on something. Um, something could be pushing or pulling something um, that would provide a, a force acting on a system. Um, air resistance can also provide a force. So there aren't really many cases in which um, this holds true um, where there's no forces acting. However, um, there are situations where the outside forces are negligible to the extent that we can ignore them. So for friction, for example, um, if you're on ice, um, the friction between the surfaces is pretty negligible, so we can ignore it. And if you have an object that is, um, if it's heavy enough, um, has enough mass, um, we, we also could ignore air resistance. I mean, obviously, if it's a feather, you can't do that. But um, there are some situations in which um, the forces acting are negligible to the extent that we will just ignore them. Okay, so the first thing you have to do when um, thinking about the law of conservation of momentum is you have to define the system. And then you have to, so what makes up the system? And then you have to look at that and say, is the sum of the forces acting on that system zero? So, um, if we have a tennis player who has a racket in her hand um, and um, a ball is hit and the ball is traveling in this direction toward the racket, okay, then when the racket hits the ball, then the ball is going to travel in the other direction. So then we have, we say, does the law of conservation of momentum apply in this situation? So what is the system? Well, the system is the racket and the system is the ball. So does the law of conservation of momentum apply um, when we just, when we consider the racket and the ball? Well, the answer is no, because the tennis player's arm is going to provide a force on the racket, um, and therefore the sum of the forces acting on the, and, and that, that force that she applies is what's going to cause the ball to um, change direction, travel in the opposite direction, probably may, perhaps at a higher velocity. Um, so the, the law of conservation of momentum does not apply um, in that situation. Um, here's another situation though, where we could think about the law of conservation of momentum. Let's say we have two ice skaters. So this is a man and he's standing still and we have a woman and the woman is going to um, skate toward the man and jump into his arms. You've seen this on the Olympics, I'm sure. Um, does the law of conservation of momentum apply here? Well, what is the system? The system is just the man and the woman. Okay, um, and yeah, there's um, there's some friction. They're on ice, um, so there is some friction. But because it's ice, we will ignore it. So. Um, are there any, besides friction, are there any outside forces acting on the man or the woman? And the answer is no. So the law of conservation of momentum would apply in this situation. So then you might say, well, what's going to happen? Well, when this, when the, um, we said that, um, so the, the mass times the velocity of the man um, and the mass times velocity of the woman, that this is the before condition. 
So then after, then when, when the man and the woman, when the woman jumps into the arms of the man, then we have, now we, their, their combined mass times their velocity has to equal the before condition. Okay, so, so here we had the, the mass of the man, and this would be zero for the man, right? So the um, P before was just due to the mass times the velocity of the woman. Over here, now they're the, you're going to have a, the combined mass times velocity has to equal the velocity of the, of the woman. So um, what will happen is that together they will move um, in the same direction that the woman was moving, but it would be at a slower velocity. But um, momentum will still be conserved because no outside forces except for negligible friction was acting on them. Um, let's look at on your own 9.4. In on your own 9.4, we are told that an astronaut is floating in space near his ship. He has a ball in his hands and is essentially motionless. He suddenly throws the ball. Does the law of momentum conservation apply to the astronaut and the ball? Okay, so this told us that the system is defined as the astronaut and the ball. So does the law of conservation of momentum apply in that case? Well, um, there's no gravity, so we don't have to worry about that um, exerting a force. And there might be some air molecules, but um, those we would consider negligible. So the law of conservation of momentum would apply because this, there are no outside forces um, acting on the astronaut and the ball. So the sum of the forces acting on the system would be um, equal to zero. Okay, then let's look at on your own um, 9.5. Um, now in this case, we have a wall and a toy car. Okay, and um, the toy car is going to travel toward the wall, it's going to crash into the wall, and it's going to stop. Okay, does the law of conservation of momentum apply in this, in this situation? So the system is the wall and the car. Okay, so the, in the before situation, the wall has no momentum, no velocity, so um, we would have the mass times the velocity of the car plus the mass times the velocity of the wall. And after, we would have the mass times the velocity of the car plus the mass times the velocity of the wall. Okay, so this would be zero in the before situation. And this would be zero in the reverse situation. So here at the beginning, the momentum is just due to the car. In the end, the, um, the wall also has no velocity. Um, and now the car has no velocity. So it's clear that there has been a change in momentum. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, what is, what is the outside force? Well, the wall is supported by both a ceiling and a floor that exert a force on the wall that keeps that wall upright. So the law of conservation of momentum would not apply in this situation because there is an outside force 
um, acting on the wall. Okay, so let's look then at the mathematics. Um, let's look at the math that is involved um, in the law of conservation of the momentum. And let's do that by um, looking at example 9.4 in your book. So in this example, we have a cannon that is mounted on wheels, so it's free to move. And the cannon is going to fire a cannonball with a velocity of 145 meters per second. And we want to know what's going to happen to the cannon. Okay, so our system is the cannon and the ball. And we are we're told to ignore friction, so there's no outside forces. So the law of conservation of mo or the sum of the forces um, acting on the cannon and the ball would be equal to zero. Um, gravity would be acting on the cannon and the ball, but those would be canceled out by the normal force. Um, so the sum of the forces acting on the cannon and the ball um, would be zero. So we can say that the law of conservation of momentum applies. Okay, so what we are told is that the cannon is 4.5 times 10 to the fifth kilograms. And we are told that the um, cannon ball is 1.2 times 10 to the fourth grams. I'm going to go ahead and convert that to kilograms. So that would be 12 kilograms. So this is the cannon. This is the ball. And we are told that the ball is fired at 145 meters per second. Okay, so um, what we've said is that P before must equal P after. Okay, so then what is the momentum before the cannonball is fired? Well, um, it would be mass times velocity of the cannon plus the mass times the velocity of the ball. And this would be four. Well, before the cannonball is fired, Neither, both the cannon and the ball are stationary. So P before is equal to zero. Okay, so then we look at what is the, so then you know that to conserve momentum, we know that the mass times velocity of the cannon plus the mass times velocity of the ball after um, must equal uh, what the momentum was before. So what we have then is that zero, I'm going to go ahead and erase this. Zero is equal to the mass times the velocity of the cannon, which we don't know its velocity. That's what we were asked to find plus the mass, oh, it's going to be 12 kilograms times the velocity of the cannonball, which is 145 meters per second. Okay, so the, this is the mass times velocity of the cannon plus the mass times the velocity of the cannonball. So to solve for this, we're going to subtract this from both sides and divide by this. So it would be negative 12 kilograms. Oh, uh, times 145 meters per second. And we'll divide that by the mass of the cannon. So your kilograms are going to cancel. You'll be left with meters per second, which is a 
appropriate velocity and your answer is going to be negative because you have a negative divided by a positive. So your answer is going to be negative 0.0038 meters per second. So when the cannonball is fired from the cannon, um, the cannon will have a will have a velocity of 0 0.0038 meters per second, and the negative just means that it's going to be going in the opposite direction of the cannonball. And um, if you've ever shot a gun, you have experienced this, uh, and we call it recoil velocity, or you might call it tick back, um, so that when a bullet is shot from a gun, in order to conserve momentum, the gun will have a velocity in the opposite direction that tends to, uh, if you're resting that gun on your shoulder, um, it will, that velocity will be in the opposite direction and will, you'll feel the force of that velocity on your shoulder. Um, as a recoil velocity, and that's all be, that is that happens because of the law of conservation of momentum. Okay, um, let's look at a couple more problems that in which we apply the law of conservation of momentum. Um, I want to look at um, example 9.5. And in example 9.5, <coughs> we have two cars. And each of those cars has a mass. And this car is moving this way. This car is moving this way. They're going to slam into each other. And they're going to stick together. So now we have, we have this. Um, and we want to know... So this car is moving at a certain velocity. That's moving at a certain velocity in the opposite direction. And we want to know what will be the new velocity of these cars when they are stuck together. Okay, so again, we look at the before situation has to equal the after. Okay, so momentum before has to equal momentum after. So before... Um, we're going to have the mass times the velocity of one car plus the mass um, times the velocity of the other car. And that's going to equal the mass of the combined cars times the velocity of the combined cars. Okay, so the first car is has a mass of 675 kilograms. And its velocity is... 19.3 meters per second. So that car is moving um, to the right. Then we're going to add to that the mass of the second car, which is 895 kilograms, times its velocity, which is negative 22.1 meters per second. Okay, so the negative here just indicates that the car is moving in the opposite direction. And that's going to be equal to the combined mass of the two cars. So if we add this and this, we get um, 1,750 or 1,550, 1,570 kilograms times the velocity of the combined cars. Okay, so if we do this. Um, and then add this, and we're it's going to be we're going to be subtracting that. What we get for this part of the equation is negative six thousand seven hundred and fifty-two kilogram meters per second. Um, and we can just have two, three significant figures. So let's make this a zero. And then um, we'll divide that to solve for this velocity. We'll divide that by 1,000. 
570 kilograms. Okay, so kilograms are going to cancel. And what we get then is that the velocity is negative 4.3 meters per second. Okay, so when the cars are moving together, stuck together, they will um, be moving at a slower velocity than either one of the two cars. And this negative sign tells us that they will be moving in the same direction as this car because it was moving in the negative direction. Okay, so in order to conserve momentum, the combined mass will move at a slower velocity in the same direction as this particular car. Okay, so that's one way that we can apply the law of conservation of momentum. Um, I also want to look now at the other problem in example 9.5. Um, and in this example, we have an empty truck. We have a truck whose mass is 1.2 times 10 cubed kilograms. Um, and it is moving at 2.2 meters per second. Then um, it's going to move under a grain hopper. And the hopper is going to jump, jump drain in, grain into the truck until it's full. And it's going to put into it um, 7.4 times 10 squared kilograms of grain. And we want to know what will the truck's velocity be when it is full. Now, this question also tells us that the truck is coasting. So since it's coasting, there's no outside forces acting on it. Nothing's pushing or pulling it. Um, and so the truck and the grain would be our system, and there's no outside forces acting on it. So the law of conservation of a momentum, momentum would apply if we if we ignore friction, which we will do. Okay, so for this question then, the mass times the velocity of the empty truck is going to equal the mass times the velocity of the full truck. Okay, so the mass times for the empty truck, it would be one point. 2 times 10 squared kilograms times 2.2 .2 meters per second. And that is going to be equal to the mass of the truck plus the grain. So I have to add these two together now to get the mass. And that is um, 1,940 kilograms. Okay, so this is empty, this is full, new, the new mass, and then times its velocity, which is what we want to solve. So let's divide both sides by this, and like 1,940 kilograms. And what we get then is um, 1.4 meters per second will equal the velocity of the full um, truck. Okay, so this the truck's the truck when it was empty was moving at 2.2 .2 meters per second. Um, because we increased the mass by adding that grain, then we see that the velocity has to decrease. So it went from 2.2 .2 meters per second to 1.4 meters per second so that uh, momentum, the law of conservation of momentum um, would be true. Okay, let's go ahead and do um, on your own 9.6.
9.7 and 9.8. Okay, so on round 9.6. Okay, in that problem, uh, what is the re recoil velocity of a 1.21 kilogram gun that shoots 25 gram bullets? So I'm going to go ahead and just change that to 0.25 kilograms um, or point zero I'm sorry point zero two five kilograms and um, it shoots those bullets at 195 meters per second okay so the uh, again, if we if we ignore air resistance, um, then we can assume that the law of conservation of momentum applies. So mass times the velocity of the rifle plus the mass times the velocity of the bullet before will equal the mass times the velocity of the rifle plus the mass times the velocity of the bullet after. Okay, so what is the velocity of the rifle and the bullet before the shot is fired? Well, it's zero, right? There's, neither one of them have any velocity. They both have masses, obviously, but neither one have any velocity, so that is equal to zero. And then we take the mass time and the mass of the rifle which is 1.21 kilograms times the velocity of the rifle, and that'll be the that'll be the recoil velocity that we're looking for. Um, and then the mass of the bullet, which is 0 0.025 kilograms, times the velocity of the bullet, which was 195 meters per second. Okay, so I'm going to subtract this from both sides and divide by this to solve it. So what we get then is negative 4.875, but we can just have three significant figures. So 4.88 kilogram meters per second divided by 1.21 kilograms. Okay, so kilograms are going to cancel. And that'll give us the velocity of the rifle or the recoil velocity of the rifle. And what we get is negative 4.0 meters per second. So that will be equal to the velocity of the rifle. Okay. Um, and we have two significant figures because of this here. So um, the velocity of the rifle, the, the negative number, just indicates that the rifle will be traveling in the opposite direction as the bullet. Um, so that is the recoil velocity of the rifle. Okay. Um, next, let's do... On your own, 9.7. And on your own, 9.7, we have a 75 kilogram astronaut who is making repairs on his ship and he loses his grip. He floats away from his ship and finds that the line which attached him to his ship has come undone. So he floats motionless in space several feet away from his ship. He understands physics, so he realizes that if he throws his wrench away from the ship due to the law of conservation of momentum, it will move him back toward the ship. So it says if he can throw the wrench with a velocity of 10.1 meters per second away from the ship, at what velocity will he travel back toward the ship? Okay, so let's write down what we what the information that we're given. We are given that the astronaut weighs 75 kilograms. Um, and 
Um, we are told that the wrench weighs 1.2 kilograms and that he is going to throw that wrench at 10.1 meters per second away from the ship. Okay, so we know that mass times the velocity of the man plus the mass times the velocity of the wrench before is going to equal the mass times the velocity of the man plus the mass times the velocity of the wrench after. Okay, so what is the mass times the velocity of the man and the wrench before? Well, it says that they are floating motionless. So this is all going to be equal to zero. And then the mass of the man is 75 kilograms. We don't know his velocity. That's what we are asked to find. And then the mass of the wrench is 1.2 kilograms times the velocity of the wrench is 10.1 meters per second. Okay, so just like we did before, we're going to subtract this from both sides and divide by this. So we'll have negative 1.2 kilograms times 10.1 meters per second divided by 75 kilograms. Okay, so kilograms are going to cancel. Our answer is going to be negative. And the answer is negative 0 0.16 meters per second. So the man throws the wrench away from the spaceship and due to the law of conservation of momentum, he will then move back toward the spaceship at a velocity of negative, uh, at a velocity of 0.16 meters per second in the direction opposite from that direction in which he threw the wrench. Okay, let's look at on your own 9.8. Okay, on your own 9.8 says we have two figure skaters performing a routine. So we have a man who weighs 75 kilograms and he is moving at 1.2 meters per second. And then we have a woman who weighs 60 kilograms and uh, wait, these are I gotta be more precise. This is 75.0 and this is 60.0 kilograms. And she is moving at negative 3.1 meters per second. So essentially we have a, a man is here, he's moving this way. The woman is here, she's moving this way and She's going to jump into his arms so that we have just a single mass. And we want to know what is their new velocity together. Okay, so mass times velocity of the man plus mass times velocity of the woman before must equal their combined mass. Um, so this is man plus woman times their velocity. Okay, so we will have 75.0 meters per sec, uh, kilograms times 1.2 meters per second plus 60.0 kilograms times her velocity, which is negative 3.1 meters per second. That negative just indicates that she's moving in the opposite direction of the man. 
Um, and then if we divide that by their combined mass, which would be 75 plus 60, which is 135 kilograms, that will give us their velocity together. Okay, so the kilograms are going to cancel, and you'll be left with meters per second. Okay, this is a positive number uh, minus this. That's going to give us a negative um, 96. So this top part is negative 96 kilogram meters per second divided by 135 kilograms. So kilograms are going to cancel, and we have a velocity of negative 0 0.71 meters per second. Okay, so as a combined, when they're when they are together, they will move um, slower than both of them were moving individually, and they will move in the direction that the woman was moving. So um, that is what is indicated by the negative number there. Okay, one more of these, and then we have just one more um, concept to cover in this module. Okay, let's look at um, on your own 9.8. Oh, no, we did that one. We did those. Okay, so we are done with those. Um, now we are ready to talk about um, angular momentum. Um, and before we talk about angular momentum, um, let's review what we learned about circular momentum. So when um, something is move, when an object is moving around in a circle, um, we, as, as that object moves to different places in the circle, we define its position based on its angle from the starting position. So uh, the object starts here, then it goes here, then it goes here, and we would define its position from the from this angle, so from, from where it started. So that position would be there. The, it's when it's third position, it would be there. When it's over here, it would be there. That angle, that angle, and that angle. Okay, so we define its position um, based on the angle from the starting position and then we so then we say that its angular velocity is the rate at which this angle changes um, it, when it, as it travels around the circle so um, we would say then that its angular velocity is the change in angle oh, the change in its um, angle theta divided by the change in time, okay? Um, and we look, I mean, that, that's basically similar to what we looked at when we looked at um, velocity. We just said was the change in position divided by time, right? Or the change in distance divided by the change in time. So this is a similar expression to that, but now we're just looking at the change um, in the angle. So what I the 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 really th thing I want you to remember is that angular velocity um, is it, it's related to linear motion, but it's different. Um, just be, just like torque is a, is related to force, but it's different. So we we said that torque is equal to the force um, times the radius. So the force that is provided supplied perpendicular uh, and then times the radius. So when we define angular momentum, we say that it is equal to mass times velocity. So this is linear momentum. 
but then we have to consider the radius um, because it's it's moving in a circle so we have to consider the radius of the circle so if we look at units here this is kilograms this is meters over seconds and this is meters so linear mo or angular momentum is the, the units are kilogram meters squared over seconds meters times meters equals meters per second okay so um, angular in, in the same way that we have to conserve linear momentum we also must conserve angular momentum so we have a law of conservation of angular momentum so if the and in in this case if the sum of the torques acting on a system is equal to zero then the angular momentum will not change it will stay the same so <clears throat> one um, example that you see of this is a child's toy where you have a ball on the end of a string and you can change the length of the string thereby changing the radius um, and then you can um, change this, the velocity at which the ball moves so basically we would just in terms of law of conservation of angular momentum we would say that mvr before equals mvr after okay so let's look at um, on your own 9.9 .9. there's no math involved in this one but in 9.9 .9, they say that we have a plate and we um, place a mouse near the center of that plate um, and the plate is spinning but then the mouse starts to move away from the center of the plate and we're asked what's going to happen to the velocity okay so here we have the mass of the mouse times the velocity um, of the plate times the radius from the center here we have the mass of the mouse time and we want to know what is what will velocity of the plate be as that mouse moves farther away from the center okay so first of all the because mass is in both of these we can ignore it um, and then obviously the mass of the mouse is not going to change so um, we just have the velocity before times the radius before times velocity after times the radius after so um, in this case uh, in order to con conserve angular momentum um, what's going to happen to the radius well the radius is going to increase right because that mouse is moving farther away from the center the radius is going to increase so if the radius increases then the velocity has to decrease so the plate is going to need to slow down um, in order for um, in order to conserve the angular momentum so if you increase the radius you have to decrease the velocity so the plate will spin at a slower velocity as the um, mouse moves away from the center okay then if we look at on your own 9.10 we have a toy that is spinning at 7.5 meters per second and its radius is 22 centimeters so we'll make that 0.22 meters and we're going to adjust the string on this toy so that the ball is now traveling at 3.2 meters per second and we want to know what is the radius okay so 
MVR before, so in the first condition of the toy has to equal MVR after. Okay. Um, again, because mass is in both equations, we can ignore it. So the velocity, 7.5 meters per second times 0.22 meters equals the velocity, 3.2 meters per second, times the new radius of the string. So we are going to just solve for r by dividing by 3.2. So we divide this by 3.2 meters per second. And that will give us r. Um, so you should be able to tell right away that um, since the velocity decreased, then the radius was going to need to increase in order to maintain angular velocity. And when we calculate r, what we end up with is 0 0.51 meters or 51 centimeters equals r. So as we said, if you decrease the velocity, then the radius is going to have to increase in order to maintain, uh, in order to conserve angular momentum. Okay, so that was um, on your own 9.10. Let me say a few things about um, or a situation where um, your, that your book mentions as um, an example in real life of um, angular momentum. Um, maybe your book mentions that usually when a cat... Um, falls from a height or is dropped from a height, that cat will often, not always, but often will land on its feet. Um, and you might wonder how that happens. Well, when the cat starts to fall, it will start to spin its tail. And then um, the body of the cat will rotate in the opposite direction so that it can conserve its angular momentum. And so when it rotates in the opposite direction, that cancels out the movement of the tail. And it also means that the cat will right itself and often will land on its feet. And then another example that maybe you, if you've watched any Olympic skating, um, If you have a figure skater that has her arms down at her side and she is spinning, so she's in, ang she's in angular motion, then what will happen if she then puts her arms out to the side? She's got long arms. Um, what will happen if she puts her arms out to the side? Well, so she has a certain velocity here with her arms uh, in their side, so the radius is short, a short radius. And now if she puts her arms out to the side, the radius is going to increase. And if the radius increases, then velocity is going to have to decrease. So I'm sure you've seen um, on the Olympics, if you've watched figure skating, where when a skater wants to spin really, really fast, what do they do? They decrease their radius by putting their arms down at their side, and when they want to slow down, they put, they extend the arms so that they increase the radius. Okay, so those are just a couple of real life examples of where you see a lot of conservation and momentum in um, practice. I'm gonna stop there, and I will make a separate video in which I will work all of the problems that are at the end of the chapter um, for Module 9.